So just get out there, get creative, and advocate for our one true queen, Mother Nature. You're listening to Climate Curious, a podcast for people who care about the world but find the current conversation about climate change confusing, boring, or scary. My name is Marian Pasha, and I'm the director and curator at Telex London and co-host of this podcast, along with the amazing Ben Hurst. Say hello, Ben. Hey there, friends. I'm Ben Hurst, activist and advocate exploring what positive masculinities can look like, humble model and climate normie. Hi, Ben. Hello. Welcome back to season two. I know, right? This is so exciting. This is so exciting. It's so exciting. I've missed it. Don't you feel excited? I know this is this is great. I'm so happy that we're back. I think we're happy. I think our listeners are happy. I think the planet should be happy that we're back. We have an epic season and this episode is no different. So I cannot express Ben how excited I am about our guest for this episode. Oh yay. This is like a, a dream dream come true for me. When we first launched this podcast, this mm-hmm. guest was someone that I was like number one on my list, on the whole Telex London team's list to get here. So it's a privilege. Are you, are you excited? You are. Uh, top of the list. Yeah, top I am. Top of the list. No <laughs> yeah, pressure. I am. No pressure. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It'll be chill. Now, you may know this person from their incredible Instagram. It's how mm-hmm. I came across them. Um, they're a intersectional environmentalist, a drag queen, and an advocate for inclusivity and diversity outdoors. We are joined today by the one and only Patagonia. Oh, hey. Hello. Hello. (laughs) I literally, I had to mute myself on the Zoom while you're doing the intro because I was just laughing the whole time. So here we are. Our our editors appreciate that. Pro, pro. Welcome. Hello. hello, It's so nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. It feels so great to be with y'all. I feel like I'm like hanging out with some friends, even though we're doing this across the pond. So I'm so excited to talk. I'm just going to dive in with a question. Yeah. Did you always love being outdoors? Hmm, that's such a good question. I mean, here's the thing. This is what I always love to say, because this is my truth. I'm like, I love the outside, (laughs) but there's nothing more I love about going outside than going inside after. I'm from Nebraska, so I'm from like rural America and like growing up like in a town that's surrounded by like farmland, I think that like it was oftentimes like people's private property. So I didn't even like really go outside to explore beyond like my backyard. But All yeah, right. but like I loved, uh, yeah, I think I've always like loved nature. I think that like I was always in the backyard doing doing something ridiculous since I was a little kid. So <laughs> doing things that kids do, you in know, the like making mud pies, like yeah, putting in the dream chalk, like mixing up chalk with like little water on the sidewalk and like using it as face paint like literally i was born to be a drag queen from like age four i just didn't know it here we are that is actually my question to you is i know you as patagonia Mm. this incredible drag queen in the outdoors six inch high heel boots just the most beautiful stuff i've seen and super powerful but i'm just i'd love for you to share with us your your journey to patty yeah (sighs) Ah, <sighs> it's been a long journey. It's been a beautiful journey. But yeah, I'm I'm excited to share with you because I think that like we all know each other as these like facades of who we are or as these very mm-hmm. forward facing things. And I think the reality is behind the scenes we're all just humans trying to figure it out. I I've known I was queer. I've known I was gay since a very young age. Like I literally remember like jumping off of a swing set in my backyard and like performing Cats the Musical for an audience of literally <laughs> like my cat, maybe, surely no humans. <laughs> Here we are. Growing up in the Midwest, growing up in rural America, I think it was just a really, yeah, it was a really unsafe place for a queer kid to be, um, especially, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I think it's really mm-hmm. different now. And I think also like, yeah, being being a queer kid and like loving the outdoors, I think also the ways that I encountered the outdoors were often really, really toxic or really hard um, or really just not necessarily for me, um, a little queer kid. Um, so like, yeah, growing up, I did Boy Scouts and I was told that a successful person in the outdoors was someone who was masculine and incredible and could bag all these peaks and could like 
conquer all these hundred mile hikes. And I was like, that's not me. I love like weaving together pine needles. <laughs> like it's, yeah. that's how I get joy. <laughs> um, or like, you know, I don't know, even, even just in outdoor media, even in just like, you know, looking at who was on ads for these different outdoor brands, it was never anyone that was like me. It was never a queer person. And I think that, um, for me that really like carried into like my coming out experience in order for you to understand Patty and my drag, you have to understand just really my experience outside of the outdoors and just like in my life as a queer person. But coming out at age 18, I think I was met with more love than a lot of queer people are. And I'm really thankful for that love. But it also was a lot of conditional love. It was a lot of love that told me, we love you and we accept you if you do this, if you don't do that, if you do this, if you stay the same, if you if you never change. And mm. Uh, that was really, really, really hard for me because I was hearing that I could still have these people's love if I never changed anything of who I was. And I think, you know, what we see in nature is that nature is always changing. Um, And I think that we get to give ourselves the beautiful invitation to keep on changing. I think a coming out experience is not just for queer people. I think it's for anyone to realize that change is a constant and change happens and we are nothing but these evolving and changing humans in life. But it was really hard for me to to hear that conditional love. I internalized a lot of that. And when I was told that I would be loved if I never painted my fingernails, if I never did drag, if I never got had my voice be more effeminate, if I never did the trans thing, um, it was stuff that I really internalized and turned into my own like internalized homophobia, internalized toxic masculinity. And that carried throughout a lot of my open open life as a gay man uh, because I lived by what everyone else told me I needed to do to be successful. And I was really good at it. I lowered mm-hmm. my voice. I wore clothes that were straight passing. I didn't really give myself queer community for 10 years of my life as an out gay male. And I think I told myself this lie that I was living this unapologetically new life, but I was completely editing everything about myself to fit in and to work within a system that told me to be something that I wasn't. And um, for me, like that exploded uh, in every direction uh, when I did drag for the first time, which, Mm. okay, so a little bit of background. So before Patty was born, I lived my life as a photographer and I used to teach at the photography conferences, it was such a beautiful progressive place where just everyone was super open-minded. There was this dance party and the invitation was just to come as whoever you wanted to be that night. And uh, I went that night uh, in drag and I went as Ginger Snap because listeners, you cannot hear this, but I am a redhead and I was a photographer. So Ginger Snap, here we are. I don't necessarily emotionally relate to her because she was like this like very like emo like bad girl with like leather gloves with like a heart cut out and like we were like biker bad babe chick i don't really know what was going on but it was like a fun little experiment (laughs) it was so crazy to look in the mirror and to see the opposite gender and to try drag and say like this is this is beautiful this is so much of myself that i left on the sidelines for so much of my life and Mm. it was like it's like one of those experiences that like changes your life you know there's just like no going back I was like wow I'm looking in the mirror and seeing my femininity like beyond me as like portraying as a female just my femininity seeing so much of what was told to me that I would never be accepted as like right there in front of me in the mirror and it was yeah it was something I'll never forget it was liberating and yeah, as uh, as the internet does these days, photos got back to the people in my life in like my hometown and in my home state. And, uh. you know, like being a photographer, I'd work for a lot of different clients. And a few of those clients, once they heard that I did drag, once they saw photos of me in drag, like canceled their work with me. Um, uh. Like my house got egged. But I think the thing that like stuck with me the most, that was the most painful was that like, people that I thought were in my corner, people that I thought loved me for everything, uh, for all of what I was, um, slowly started to tiptoe out of my life. Um, And I think we experience this a lot, even with the climate movement too, because once our friends start to see that we are thinking about the environment, making more eco-conscious decisions, people judge us a lot, or people think that we are like holier than thou, or that we're different, and people just slowly start to back away. And so I saw that in my life and it sucked. It was really painful. And it was just this moment where I was like, 
Is what I thought about the world really true? Do people that I really think are my community really love me? And it turns out that a lot of those people didn't, but it turns out that a lot of those people like did. And I think that like now three years later, I can honestly say that like that experience in my life of truly embracing drag was almost like my real coming out of the closet experience. It was like this moment Mm. for me where I felt like I truly walked into the world as my true self. Um, So then when, so, so up until this point, yeah, you were still ginger snap. Yeah. So, so literally I did drag that one time as ginger snap, but because it was so painful, I literally remember being like, screw this. I am going to put these boots into my closet. Like this experience is too much. I don't need to do this anymore. Like whatever. So literally these six inch Mm. high heel, like black boots, I just put in my closet and said, screw it. And it wasn't until like six months later, like literally six months later when I was packing for a backpacking trip and I was looking on the floor and I was looking at my backpacking backpack, which was right next to these high heel boots that I decided, (laughs) hmm, what if I just pack these boots in my pack and I put in my pack and I went out for this backpacking trip and no one knew on this trip that I had these high heel boots um, Mm -hmm. until we reached the summit. And I put on these boots um, and I like strutted in the outdoors on this trail and I said, this feels so good like no one's out here to judge me i can be who i am i can be what i want to be and literally like y'all i like took these photos and videos on this trip of me in high heel boots like also just to give everyone like a clear representation if they don't know what patty is like patty in the beginning was literally just me in high heel boots there was no other drag elements it was very much just like me in my like life just like strutting down the trail in these boots and i went home And I edited this video on the couch with my mom. Uh, She was like, you should put this clip here. You should put this clip here. And like posted this Mm. video on this joke Instagram account called Patagonia. And literally woke up to like 11 million views on this video the next day. And it was kind of like, okay, here we are again. Like, am I going to choose myself? Am I going to choose going for like this beautiful journey of who I want to be um, and who I really am? Or am I going to just put these boots back into the closet again? And I'm Mm -hmm. so glad that I decided to just keep on going with it because the real story, the real journey is that like me pursuing living my life unapologetically has led to me falling in love with the climate movement, has led to me meeting some of the most incredible, beautiful people that I've ever met in my life. And I can't imagine my life without it. Patty symbolizes so much to me and I couldn't imagine my life without without her. That story is... So like, I feel like that's like 18 different podcasts <laughs> in itself. And we could like literally yeah. just talk about all of like that experience of coming out. One of the things I really resonated with that you were saying, right, was this idea of um, growing up and go- going to Scouts. I went to Scouts for like a week and a half, two weeks, maybe. I was not here for it. They tried to make me go and do stuff in the River Road in, and I was like, no, <laughs> this is, it's over. I'm not doing it. Um, but I like, and, and I know there's this, these like uh, stereotypes or tropes that like black people don't like the outdoors and all of this kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to this idea of like the outdoors not being for you like i think that was something that you kind of alluded to there or this idea that that wasn't a space that you were meant to be in and and like why was that and what what was that like yeah um wow yeah i'm so glad you brought that up i i feel like up until now and still like we're still facing this but like the outdoors have just been so gate kept they've been so gate kept by white and straight and cis people uh, to Mm. be only for white and straight and cis people. Uh, And, you know, I'm going to be real with you, Ben. I live at a very interesting intersection because I do drag in the outdoors. I do something that's incredibly queer. I build queer community, but also I am white and I am straight passing Mm. and I am a male out of drag. So it's just, it's a really interesting space where I feel like I'm really recognizing from all sides there's so much work to do. And I think that also like, yeah, the outdoors have just been gatekept too because of just like colonization. Like, let's just also talk about like in America, like 
colonizers just came and took over native spaces, um, made it theirs. It's now Yosemite National Park. It's not the reservation of the native people that live there. And it's right. It's a really interesting intersection to love the outdoors so much and also recognize how much work there is to do and also still how many barriers exist for diverse people to get into the outdoors. You know, We think about something like a national park too. And yeah, that's great if you have a weekend where you cannot work and if you have a car and if you feel comfortable enough to get out onto the trails and not face discrimination but hello that is not the experience of a majority of people in america so i think we Mm. really just need to think about really making an outdoors that truly is for all and matching that with action do you say you do drag in the outdoors and the only understanding of drag i have is like Mm. maybe two nightclubs that i've been to in london and 13 seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race <laughs> and four seasons of All Stars because I didn't watch season one. But I, that's all I understand. <laughs> that's all I understand of drag. So and I and I've never seen drag done outdoors. So what does what does like climate activism and drag look like for you? What does that mean? Yeah, totally. Um, well, like so. Here's the thing. There are. There's so much more to the art form of drag than RuPaul's Drag Race or the nightclubs. And here's the thing, I didn't know it either until I started doing it. You know, I had no idea that people did drag as an art form to communicate so much. I mean, let's take it back to the beginning. Like drag's roots Mm -hmm. were by BIPOC people performing in drag for the sake of activism and advocacy. Like that's the art Mm -hmm. form of drag was birthed in activism. So when I think about like what I'm doing, I'm like, I feel like I'm just doing work on the shoulders of greats and honestly trying to bring drag back to its roots of truly being for activism, being for a purpose. You know, it was used Mm. in the LGBTQ movement of awareness, of, of inclusion, of performance art that's by queer people, for queer people. And so if anything, I don't think I'm reinventing the wheel at all. I think that I'm doing like what its original purpose was for. There was something you said when we spoke last time that has just really stuck with me and I wanted to 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 dig into it a little bit if we can to be honest i've always felt like the outdoors isn't for me mm-hmm. either and when we spoke you said this thing about as a queer person being told that the outdoors wasn't for you i found this so powerful and i wonder if you just tell us a bit more about it growing up i was told from everyone especially people in the outdoors that queerness or being gay was completely unnatural and so i was like well then i can't spend time out in nature and like natural environments like if i'm not that and i think mm-hmm. that it has been a completely reclaiming of like my identity in the outdoors as a queer person, but also an internal representation of that my queerness is natural too. Like, and in fact, queerness represents itself in every living thing on planet earth, far beyond sexuality, but queerness and environments and how organisms work together and how things survive and how things adapt to thrive. Queerness is everywhere in the natural world. So when I see that in nature, I can accept that in myself. I mean, that is, that's so important, Mm. right? Like this idea of, of, of finding ourselves reflected out there and seeing that we're being, that we are a part of something. And I guess that really goes to the root of making this space more accessible, Mm. um, which feels like it's really at the heart of what you do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. I think about how much the outdoors have changed my life now through a completely healthy view. And I want that for every queer person. You know, I think that the queer experience so often is to run to cities and to metropolitan spaces for acceptance. And no wonder, because we find queer community uh, in, in these metropolitan spaces, in cities, in bars, in nightclubs. But I also think we can find acceptance and community in the outdoors too, in rural spaces too. Um, And I think it's so important. I think it's so important to be connected to nature, especially as a queer person, to just give yourself space and time to just discover who you are. And yeah, I I want that for everyone. I want that for every queer person. One of the things that I want to ask, and I'm interested in this idea of seeing queerness in nature, because I don't have the frame of reference to see that. And I almost feel stupid. Do you know, like it feels like a dumb question to ask, but, but I feel like it's definitely there and I just can't see it because I'm not looking for it. Is it, are you talking about like animals or are you talking about plants or are you talking about literally everything? Yeah, okay, so I love that you brought this up. And so like, I've done some like light reading myself, but like through meeting other like incredible like outdoor humans and just like people that are just so deep in in the roots of queer ecology, like people, okay, 
quick shout out here, my friends Pinar and So who run Queer Nature, incredible people mm-hmm. that people can learn from. They're indigenous, they're non-binary, they're just incredible people who speak to this all the time. But yeah, I think what I mean is like, it's so much different than just like some gay dolphins in the ocean. You know what I mean? Like that's not right. what I mean when yes. I think of gay nature. Like I, it's it's so much more than that. It's like there are fish that can completely change gender throughout their life. Um, right. Certain trees and like plant life can pollinate themselves. If we look at environments where, uh, just where uh, different organisms or different elements of that ecosystem are up against a lot, oftentimes the way that that organism or that thing survives is through a queer solution of being able to adapt and to change. And so when I think of queerness, mm. it's so much more beyond sexuality. Queerness is just the oddity in this world to problem solve no matter what, to almost be different and to bring beauty and brilliance to that through their difference and through that identity that makes sense to me yeah. i get that yeah. and and i think there's also something really important about like you spoke earlier about like this the, the colonial lens that we apply to um uh, uh climate activism totally. um and I think there's also this like colonial lens that's applied to gender, right? Like where, like there's a binary that's like 100%. it's this or this, and it's that's so interesting what you say about the fish that can like change gender. I'm going to Google that afterwards. So listen, so here's a cool story. So there was a cardinal that was just found um, in kind of like the northeast United States that is like an intersex cardinal and literally has its gender markings straight between this white side of this cardinal that is the female cardinal and this red side which is the male side of the cardinal, and we're literally mm-hmm. seeing right there that like intersex creatures exist in nature beyond humans Um, and i think that's a really literal example but to your point i think hitting like queerness in nature on the head is we live in this world as humans where we put things into boxes and categories because it's the only way for our brain to make sense of them but literally categories do not exist binaries do not exist at all all when we can remove the binary thinking of black and white into this murky gray beautiful rainbow there's so much else out there than just either or or this or that or male and female or gay or straight there's so much more of a world there that's so nice that you're like you're able to articulate that because it, it feels to me which i think is probably a big part of the the climate conversation that we're missing you know what i love about that um is I love about it is and and Ben's heard me banging on about this forever is that you know sometimes the climate movement gets too far removed from people Mm. it becomes about this abstract thing that we're trying to do yeah, we have to view each other as people right if the environmental space keeps on being what it is currently which is pretty elitist, is obsessed with perfection, is also a complete space that's gatekept, we're never going to get people involved. And I think that if we can advocate for a place that is accepting to all, that celebrates diversity as the most important part of our ecosystem of the climate movement, well, that's an ecosystem that's going to thrive. And I mean, and we need that, right? Like we need everyone to be involved. And one of the things I'm curious about, because you you kind of alluded to it before, you know, and, and I guess a lot of people probably do see you as a as a climate leader or a mm. climate expert. How has it been to occupy, like to, to inhabit that space for you? Yeah, I really like disengage from the term of being a leader. <laughs> uh, I say disengage lovingly, but honestly, literally when people say like, you're a climate leader, I like throw up a little bit in my mouth. I'm like, no, I'm not. Like... I think that for me, like my job, my role, and like what I'm the best at is just building community and conversation. Like I'm never the Mm. voice that I want people to listen to. Like I just want to make the space to be like, come humans and listen to way other smarter people than me talk about these things that actually matter. So that feels way better to me. And I think of like, you know, listen, like drag queens, like what we are is we are hosts, we are space makers, we are community makers. And I think that like my role is oftentimes just to be like an almost like an MC of the space and to kind of like moderate the space and to bring value by like bringing people there. But then letting the true acts shine and uh, come to life on the stage of people that are way more intersectional voices in the climate movement. Um, I feel like I'm like this little fetus toddler. Like I just started this work like two years ago. Like I'm so new at this. Like I'm just trying to figure it out. But what I do know is that like anyone can build community in a way that works for them. Even if that community is just 
their parent at a dinner table that will listen to them for an hour, you know, like that's community and that's a conversation that's worth it, <coughs> have, you know? Mm. So I don't know. I think that like, we need less of these like views of leaders of just like, oh my gosh. And like Patagonia, like on a mountaintop looking so stunning in the drag, paving the way for whatever. No, it's not. Like I'm just joining the group of other people that are like fighting for intersectionalism and the climate movement in their own unique ways. My way just includes wearing six, six inch heels on the side of a mountain. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't give a crap about our climate or about our planet before mm. I started doing uh, Patty. Um, really, like, drag and being in the outdoors more is what really changed my perspective on everything. Like, I, I never mm. felt connected to it. And I think, like, now, AP, after Patty, the rule I try to live by is how can you give more than you can take, you know? And so when I go into the outdoors now, I'm wondering how can I give to this space? How can I give to the people out there? How can I give to the climate movement more than I'm taking from it? We also have this view of like activism where we're going to just get into it and be perfect at it and never going to mess up. And we're going to be this shiro, right. hero, they row, like I am here and like I am figured everything out. And it's like, it is so not that like it is messy. It is sticky. I mess up all yeah. the time. I think that's the thing about allyship that gets people, because in a way, you know, this is a form of allyship, right? right. That gets people scared is that they're going to do it wrong and they're going to get like called out. Yeah. Right. And I, cause I, I think of like, allyship is like the art of trying and making mistakes and being really good at apology i wonder now that you're in this space and and people are heralding you as like a, a climate leader climate change leader even though it makes you throw up in your mouth a little bit um where are there, are there other areas where you see that happening or where you where you see like that kind of dynamic of people taking more than they give or maybe things that are not quite right yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Every time I try to be like, hmm, this person I don't think is doing right or is taking more than they're giving. I'm like, how can I refocus that energy on myself and what right. I can control? And I think that's a, that tends to be a little bit more productive way for, for me to like use that energy. But like, I mean, y'all like, listen, I just like want to call it like it is. I think like, I'm so afraid, like I still feel afraid as, as a person in this space that I'm gonna mess up or I'm gonna say the wrong thing. And I also am very aware that this giant thing exists called cancel culture that goes after people and right. and really is a completely toxic force and not, I feel like, restorative justice force in the climate movement. And I think that like we also get to advocate for a community that's intersectional that also values like restorative justice, that also values people messing up and learning and growing rather than being exiled from the community and never ever providing any value again. Like I think that we really need to tackle that internally within the climate movement. I think it's really been important for me to orient to like listen to the people that are doing the work beside me and also are holding me accountable, you know? I don't wanna yeah. I don't wanna get out of jail free card. I just want accountability with love, with also doing the work. And oftentimes I think if we really look at the people who are calling out people the most or that are leading cancel culture, they're some of the people that are doing the work the least. So my encouragement is just like you're going to encounter cancel culture. You're going to encounter people who are going to disagree with you. It is okay to be true to what you believe or also to be open-minded to saying, ooh, that was a blind spot. Now that I know better, I can do better. Apologize and get back in there because there's work to do. One of the things we really try to do on this podcast is make sure that people who are listening to this, who are super inspired, yeah. can really take something into their life with it. And I'm just yeah. curious what you would like people to take away from listening to you. Hmm. I have two things for us that I think are, are things. Uh, I can't pick one of them. Um, I think we so often hear that we have to advocate for climate now. We have to fight for climate justice and racial justice now. We have to do all this. We have to be all that. We have to look this way, look that way. And yes, that is true, but also we have to connect to our climate now. To be connected to nature, I think we're going to end up far more equipped and far more ready to advocate for our climate because I think we fight for what we love. So I think if we can fall in love with ourselves, if we can fall in love with people different than ourselves, if we can fall in love with nature, we're going to advocate for all of it better. So just take a second to connect to nature. You're going to be so much better equipped to fight for it. The second thing I would say is 
use your creativity for climate action. I think especially for all you youth and kids listening to this, I'm like, tick tock the heck out of this climate movement. Use your creativity, use your voice, use your platform for climate action, to say something, to do something. I think if we really look at it, some of the most genius work in the climate movement right now is when creativity is being applied to climate solutions. Whether that is using your creativity through your art form of science, or your art form as a photographer, or your voice as a human on your platform, use your creativity, make it fun, make it collaborative, like get together with friends and do this stuff. And I think it's gonna feel a lot better to your bones and it's gonna be a lot more fun. So just get out there, get creative and advocate for our one true queen, Mother Nature. Mother Nature, that's, that's Mother such Nage. a good answer. This conversation, I'm sad, I'm sad that it's coming to an end, but I'm excited that we get to do one more thing with you, Paddy, right? What is that, Ben? Oh, it's climate confessions. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. I love this. Climate confessions. If you haven't done it before, if you haven't heard this before, this is the part where our guests get to tell you what they have been doing or have not been doing in regards to climate action. So we are interested to know if you have any climate confessions that you feel like sharing today. Oh my gosh. I love this. It's like the hot seat climate edition. <laughs> yeah. This is great. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm like, I like live climate confessions every day. Cause I always feel like I have, here's the thing, living life as win out of drag. I feel like I always have Patty sitting on my shoulder. That's like, you bad bitch. You should right. not be doing that. Like <laughs> you should be doing something better. So I feel like, you know, it's like my little conscience that lives on my shoulder. It's a drag queen. And here's my biggest climate confession. Like I live at the intersection of making drag as sustainable as I can right now, knowing what I know, but also knowing that drag is an inherently wasteful like art form because it's like, mm. y'all listen, like drag makeup, I can't use this natural mineral makeup stuff. Like everyone's like, you should just use all natural mineral. I'm like, do you realize that I have to draw a completely new face on my face? Like I cannot do that with minerals. Like I literally have to use clown paint. <laughs> so it's like, there's that. Like, literally y'all last year I had this moment where I was like, oh my God wigs are made of plastic like literally like every wig oh, I wear, yeah. it's yeah. just a form of plastic so i'm like how can i even reimagine wigs so literally like this past year we made this wig out of like literally hundreds of just different wrappers from my time in quarantine and made a wig out of it mm. and it's awesome and i think it's just like my drag isn't perfectly sustainable, but I'm like trying to figure it out from the ground up. And so it mm. means literally making small changes first. I'm so sad that we've come to an end, but it's just been such a delight, Paddy, to have you here and to, for you to take the time out of what I know is a really busy schedule to, to chat with us and to share this journey. So thank you so much. Thank y'all so much. We need y'all making this space real and that's what y'all are doing you are cut into the real real and it is so appreciated so thank you for having me i stand you all and i cannot wait to listen to this <laughs> whole second season thank you so much for joining us this week we really hope you enjoyed this episode if you did please rate subscribe and share this episode with a curious friend it makes us possible to keep making this amazing content for you oh and slide into our dms at tedx london and let us know which climate extraordinaires you'd love to hear from next time oh and don't leave yet we wanted to tell you a bit more about who made this podcast possible yeah we did TEDx London's headline partner, City, has been supporting us for the past five years to bring world-changing ideas to the TEDx London stage. And now they're taking it to the next level by making this podcast possible. Thanks, City. But wait, that is not all. No, this podcast was produced by the amazing Josie Coulter. Curation and research by the genius Tara Cooper. Artwork designed by the visionaries that are Sabrina Russo and Rebecca Mingus. Mixed and engineered by the iconic Ben Beheshti, a.k.a. The Falcon, who also composed our banging theme tune. Presented by me, Marion Pasha. And by me, Ben Hurst. Stay curious.